A cursory examination of the history of imperialist expansion in the late 19th and early 20th century reveals one thing very clearly. Third world resistance, where it existed, was crushed with speedy efficiency. In terms of conventional military thinking, such success was not unexpected. Together with the Allied experience in the First and Second World Wars, they served to reinforce the notion that superiority in military capability meant victory in war. However, the history of a number of conflicts in the period following World War II showed that military and technological superiority may be a highly unreliable guide to the outcome of wars. In the wars of decolonization that took place in the mid to late 20th century, indigenous nationalist forces gained their objectives in armed confrontations with industrial powers who possessed an overwhelming superiority in conventional military capability. To understand the degree to which the outcome of these wars presented a radical break from the past, it is instructive to examine the case of the French colony of Indochina, which was comprised of modern-day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The French successfully subjugated the peoples of Indochina for more than 60 years with a locally based army only 15,000 strong. The situation changed dramatically after 1946, when the Vietnamese took up arms in a guerrilla struggle. By 1954, the nationalist forces of the Viet Minh had forced the French, who by this time had deployed an expeditionary force of nearly 200,000 men, to concede defeat and withdraw their forces in ignominy. Twenty years later, a vast U.S. military machine with an expeditionary force 500,000 strong had also been forced to withdraw. In the field of conflict research, the study and the outcome and conduct of wars has received remarkably little attention. Arguably, it is easier to explain why the insurgents were not defeated than it is to explain the related but more interesting question, how and why the external power was forced to withdraw. This video is an abridged version of political scientist Andrew Mack's seminal 1975 article, Why Big Nations Lose Small Wars, which provides a paradigmic perspective by which the outcome of such asymmetric conflicts might be explained. In his days as a guerrilla warfare commander, Mao Zedong noted that defeat is the invariable outcome when native forces fight with inferior weapons against modernized forces on the latter's terms. As one scholar wrote, by and large, it would seem what made the machinery of European troops so successful was that native troops saw fit to die with glory, with honor, in mass, and in vain. Thus, the first condition for avoiding defeat is to refuse to confront the enemy on his own terms. To avoid being crushed, the insurgent forces must retain a degree of invulnerability, but the defensive means to this end will depend on the conditions of the war. In guerrilla warfare in the classical sense, the people see forms a sanctuary for popular support for the guerrilla fish. In urban guerrilla warfare, the anonymity of the city provides protection. Operating from uninhabited areas and supplied from without, for example, the North Vietnamese operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War, the insurgents might simply rely on the mountains and forests to conceal and protect them. In every case, success for the insurgents arose not from a military victory on the ground, though military success may have contributed, but rather from the progressive attrition of their opponent's political ability to wage war. In such asymmetric conflicts, Insurgents may gain political victory from a situation of military stalemate or even defeat. The Vietnam War demonstrated how, under certain conditions, the theater of war extends well beyond the battlefield to encompass the political system and social institutions of the external power. The Vietnam War may be seen as having been fought on two fronts, one bloody and indecisive in the forests and mountains of Indochina, the other essentially nonviolent, but ultimately more decisive, within the social and political institutions of the United States. The nature of the relationship between these two conflicts, which in fact are the different facets of the same conflict, is critical to an understanding of the outcome of the war. In his highly prophetic paper published in 1969, Henry Kissinger observed of America's war in Vietnam, quote, We fought a military war. Our opponents fought a political one. We sought physical attrition, our opponents aim for our psychological exhaustion. In the process, we lost sight of one of the cardinal maxims of guerrilla warfare. The guerrilla wins if he does not lose. The conventional army loses if it does not win. However, the American experience was in no sense unique, except that it happened to Americans. In 1954, the Viet Minh destroyed the French forces, which were mustered at Dien Bien Phu in a classic set peace battle. The direct military costs of the French have been much exaggerated, only 3% of the total French force in Indochina was involved. The psychological effects, however, were shattering. The Viet Minh, of course, did not defeat France militarily. 
they lacked not only the capability, but also any interest in attempting such a move. The outcome of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, however, had the effect of destroying the political capability of the French government to mobilize further troops and to continue the struggle. The Vietnam War, for which the Vietnamese revolutionaries has now lasted a quarter of a century, has emphasized enormous importance on what guerrilla strategists call protracted warfare. This is articulated most clearly in Mao Zedong's works, but it is also found in the military writings of North Vietnamese General Giep. The certainty of eventual victory, which is a result of intensive political mobilization by the guerrilla leadership, is the key to a critical factor in such conflicts, the willingness to absorb costs. Mao's strategic theory, that it is based on the premise that if the totality of the population can be made to resist surrender, this resistance can be turned into a war of attrition, which will eventually and inevitably be victorious. Above all, the Vietnam War is a reminder that in war, the ultimate aim must be to affect the will of the enemy. Most strategic theorists would, of course, concur with this view. But in practice, a prevalent military belief that if the opponent's military capability to wage war can be destroyed, his will to continue the struggle is irrelevant. It is not surprising that this should be a prevalent belief in modern industrial societies where strategic doctrine tends to mold itself to available technology. Guerrilla strategists see strategy in very different different terms. Lacking the technological capability or the basic resources to destroy the external enemy's military capability, they must of necessity aim to destroy his political capability. If the external power's will to continue the struggle is destroyed, then its military capability, no matter how powerful, is totally irrelevant. It is not enough to destroy the metropolitan power's forces in the field alone, since they can simply mobilize more forces at home and dispatch them to the battlefield. The constraints on mobilization are political, not material. In none of the conflicts noted was more than a fraction of the total potential military resources of the metropolitan power mobilized. The US war in Vietnam had an enormous impact on American society and politics, but the maximum number of US troops in Vietnam at the peak of the ground war in 1968 amounted to no less than one quarter of 1% of the American population. The political constraints operating against full mobilization of the metropolitan forces arise as a consequence of the conflicts within the metropolis, both within the political elite and in the wider society, which the war, by its very nature, will inevitably tend to generate. Battles and campaigns are not isolated contests of military power. The final outcome of war depends on a much wider range of factors, many of them highly elusive, such as war's impact on domestic politics. To paraphrase Clausewitz, politics may become the continuation of war by other means. Therefore, the military struggle on the ground must be evaluated not in terms of the narrow calculus of military tactics, but in terms of its political impact in the metropolis. Thus, although the 1968 Tet Offensive was a military defeat for the North Vietnamese guerrilla forces in terms of the military calculus of body counts, the offensive was, in fact, a major strategic defeat for the U.S. and marked the turning point in the war. The impact of Tet on American domestic politics led directly to U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson's decision not to stand for another term of office. And, for the first time, military requests for more resources, a further 200,000 men, were refused despite the fact that the military situation had worsened. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please share and subscribe.